Morning Java, Matt Sunday, Chris Bradford, get go. As always, Cafe and Market, where right now, Chris, you can, while you're doing all of this Penguins travel, you can stop at all the get goes in between, eat a salad, eat a wrap, eat all the, the good, healthy stuff you can get. I'm going to have to do that on my way up uh, to Toronto this weekend. I figure I might have to stop between every get go between here and Erie. Yeah, you'll be headed up there. The Penguins, of course, four games in this week. Uh, you'll be at three of them. You won't, you won't be at Fridays at home because you'll be on your way to Toronto. But uh, let's talk about the one Wednesday night, the one it's a big two one. night against the uh, Tampa Bay Lightning. It's a big game. It is a big game. It's the NHL leading Tampa Bay Lightning, the team that everyone, I think, expected to be where they are. It's a team that everyone has made the prohibitive favorite to win the Stanley Cup. And here we are through uh, almost February, and it looks like this is, the Tampa Bay Lightning are still that team that everyone is uh, picking to win. Cooch. They got Kucherov, yes. They got Stamkos, they got Tyler Johnson, they got Victor Hedman, Andre Vasilevsky. We could go on and on. This is a very stacked team. Yeah, they're stacked. Uh, you know, the Penguins having all kinds of issues on the power play. That's not necessarily an issue that the Lightning are having, and, and the no. Penguins are going to have to stay out of the box. On this no, one. you know, the Penguins' PK is pretty good, but Tampa Bay special teams is pretty good too, ranks in the top 10 in both categories. But that power play is lethal. You watch those guys just move the puck around. It's... It's a goal almost every time, it looks like. You know, out in Winnipeg and then, and then back here, watching Line A take those, uh, those one-timers practice them during the morning skate, I mean, he's just relentless about it. But how do you defend Stamkos on one side and Kucherov on the other? Yeah, you got to defend that seam pass. They're going to try to work it across. And, you know, the Penguins have had some success against that. Uh, they see a lot of it, obviously, with the Washington Capitals run something kind of similar and the Philadelphia Flyers where they have the two uh, flanker shots for the one-timers. Yeah, it's deadly. It's fun to watch. <laughs> it's fun to watch, but easy for me to say. <laughs> man, it's scary. And and you know, Taylor dug up some stats for us after after the game Monday night. Talked about how the Penguins are dead last in in, in high danger percentage save percentage mm -hmm. on the power play or on the penalty kill. Mm -hmm. That's going to be a big issue, regardless of who's in net for the Penguins. Yeah, I mean, I assume it's going to be Matt Murray. Now he's a little bit better, I think, at that situation than uh, Casey DeSmith. So I would assume it'll be Matt Murray, especially against Tampa Bay. Uh, prime time, eight o'clock game, NBC. So, you know they have to they have to bear it down. I mean, this is a team. That Mike Sullivan talks about you know paying attention to details and having a defensive conscience and stuff like that. Even more so against Tampa because the way the Penguins got embarrassed against the last place team like the New Jersey Devils, it could get much worse against a team like Tampa. Chris, for a team that has Evgeny Malkin, Sidney Crosby, Phil Kessel, Chris Letang. Anybody else on the ice, Patrick Hornquist, Gensel, why does it seem like the Penguins are giving up as many goals on the power play as they are scoring? Uh, I know, it's, it's crazy. There's 11 shorthanded goals they've given up now. Uh, you know, it's, there's usually not a common theme because there's so many of them. I asked Sidney Crosby about that, and he's like, there's 11 of them. There's so many different things. It's been one thing or another, but, you know, it's usually, I hate to say it, but it's been Evgeny Malkin. Like, against New Jersey, that was the case. It was a turnover right at the blue line. goes the other way. Uh, it's a team game. A lot of things that can happen. You could defend the two-on-one better. Matt Murray or Casey DeSmith could make a save in, in those situations. But it's just way, way too many. Mike Sullivan always says about the defensive conscience, but you know, I, I think it's in their heads a little bit. Yeah, Dayon kind of nailed it a little bit after Monday's game, talking about the zone entries. And normally the Penguins are pretty good there. I mean, whether it's Latang or Phil Kessel or, or even Evgeny Malkin, the one thing that Malkin's done all, all season consistently is that I've brought it up several times, but the kind of dilly dallying at the blue line yep. where you get indecisive, you go to make a move, somebody goes off sides, or you decide to fire the puck trying to get through a stick or get through a couple legs. And that's what we saw a, a couple times Monday night. You know, it sends the puck in the other, the other direction. But I mean, they've, they've got to figure out a way to get into the zone before they can make anything. Yeah, happen. I like what they did, and they haven't done it as much this year. I think they used a lot more last year was that kind of the giant drop pass with Latang and get, let Phil Kessel carry mm -hmm. the mail. You know, he's, you know, 200-whatever pounds, and when he's <laughs> moving, he's, he's tough to handle. So that's how I would prefer to see the Penguins get the zone. I mean, I'm not saying the Penguins should dump it in like that, but if Kessel has the puck on his stick, I think that gives them their best chance. And it's just a matter of converting. I mean, against New Jersey, they go 0 for 5, and obviously – as good as the Penguins' power play is, it does have the natural ebbs and flows where, you know, you're not going to always score, but hopefully you can gain momentum on the next shift and carry it over. Sure, yeah. I mean, with, with kind of the goal-scoring drought on the power play, I'd like to see not only Phil Kessel bring the puck in more and not trying to fall into that Malkin trap of, you know, finding somebody 
fancily across the blue line in some way. But just get into the zone, man. Yeah. Like, like just Bobby Orr, peel off the boards, <laughs> you know, look like Broussard. Broussard does it all the time. That's one of the things that he does five on five that he doesn't do on the power play. That yeah. it's like, yeah, the second power play has looked pretty good lately for whatever reason. I mean, they don't get a lot of time, but they have found some success. But it's interesting. We talk about the number one power play and the number two power play. Mike Sullivan hinted at uh, some changes to the, the both power play units. He did that earlier in the season in November when they went through a four game losing streak. He didn't really follow through on it. I think they may have used it one or two times, but it could happen again against Tampa. Chris, you know, <laughs> you follow the game more than, more than most people in the world. You know, you love, you love to investigate rosters. You love to look at the history of teams, the history of sports. How many players can you realistically name on this Edmonton Oilers team that are good supporting hockey players for Connor McDavid? <sighs> One, Leon Draisaitl. I think he's a, you know, an all-star type player, uh, not quite in the Connor McDavid category, but when you talk about this last weekend at the NHL All-Star game, you know, asking all these players, who do you think the best player in the game is? And, of course, in Pittsburgh, we're a little biased. We're going to still say it's Sidney Crosby. Right. Lemieux was the greatest ever. Yeah, and Mario Lemieux was the greatest ever. But when you hear some different voices, you know, hey, everyone's saying Connor McDavid. Yeah, you know, I, I read your, your piece coming back from, from his San Jose, and – it was surprising to see not only just everybody kind of default to McDavid at this point because mm -hmm. in the past it would have been, you know, Crosby with a couple of Ovechkins mixed in. But uh, not just that, but seeing other guys uh, mention guys like Patrick Kane in the mix yep. or, or Kucherov or, or whoever, um, there's a lot of guys around the league who think differently of different players. But I guarantee you everybody in the league would want to play with Connor McDavid. So what's it going to take for the Oilers to put together a team know, and see, that's, that's they're a, wasting this guy's career what's going well, on they're, they're wasting his prime because he's now you know a few seasons into this and you know he's had his second year he had some uh, had a playoff run at least but obviously that's not going to happen this year and realistically if the Edmonton Oilers are going to win a Stanley Cup it's probably going to be another four or five years by the time they would have a, a supporting cast around Connor McDavid to even think about it so uh, it, to me it looks a little bit like Mario Lemieux with the Penguins early on in his career where you know the Penguins were floundering and it took some time before 1991 came around, the Penguins were a legitimate Stanley Cup team. Yeah, I mean, they're going to have chances. They're going to continue to get, <laughs> get chances in the draft. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're, lo we're looking at, you know, in every sport, you know, the Jacksonville Jaguars situation of finally being good for a year or two. But when, when is that going to happen? What's crazy is the Edmonton Oilers had had so many first-round picks and top picks, and they squandered all of them. And McDavid's really the only guy standing up there, and there's nothing. But Schultz is a Penguin. Thank <laughs> you.